Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation where the Supreme Court ruling related to affirmative action has stimulated a full review of college admission processes and criteria across the nation. We're joining me in a conversation on the changing environment for college admissions is James Pennix, Vice President for Enrollment Management at Roanoke College, and Dr. Danette Fing, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Strategic Communications at Radford University. So thank you both very much for joining our conversation. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having us. Well, so um, actually, in fact, I know that um, COVID seems to be have changed almost everything. But even prior to COVID, and certainly before the uh, court case, um, it seemed like there was changing about uh, admissions for maybe what, six years or more? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so I think, it, can, is it fair to say that um, there's a difference between universities in terms of how they approach it, admissions, but is it difference also between the state and, and private? What ways may they differ in terms of, is, in other words, a private have more latitude than state? Yeah, I think there's a, that's a um, good difference between public and private. Um, we all are similar how we do reviews, um, gaining the information, but you know, that's 4,000 college universities um, within the country, um, and we all have different ways that we have strategic priorities. Um, so if you're building a new history, history building, you want to make sure you're able to recruit more history majors. Um, so we all have um, slight differences. I worked at both public and private, so I would say um, the biggest thing is the um, amount of applications and the amount of interest that you have, but some of the processes are similar, very similar. And would you agree? I would agree, and so every institution has a different flavor and they all have, as JP mentioned, a different goal. And so in admissions and enrollment, you're trying to reach that strategic goal. Every university has a mission statement and you try to align with that mission statement, areas of growth, areas of interest, and you match that um, with the way that you do admissions. You know, one thing that, another distinction perhaps, um, is what you refer to as elite institutions um, versus access institutions. What's the difference there? It's really acceptance rate. Um, mm -hmm. And so depending on how many applications you get versus how many spots you have and that rate of admission in order to fill those spots really sets apart those that are highly selective schools versus schools that are less selective. Some called access schools. Access schools often are schools that try to lower every single barrier. So like community colleges or access schools as an example, um, you need just amount of uh, credentials to be able to take classes at a community college. And so schools similar to ours are really trying to lower those barriers and become more accessible and affordable for, for students. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, I, I think it really comes down to, um, like Danette is saying, about the acceptance rate. Um, you find the very selective school gets a lot of attention in that conversation, but I think schools like Radford University, Ronald College, um, we're trying to be more accessible to attract students from all um, different populations throughout the state. I know for a private school, we do heavy recruiting out of state. Um, so those priorities are, may not be what you find at a state school um, that has to really have a certain um, kind of priority when it comes to in-state recruitment. Mm -hmm. I, I happen to have the privilege of serving on the Board of Visitors at Virginia State University. Awesome. And as an HBCU, mm -hmm. admission is very important and access because 60 to 70 percent of those are uh, pale eligible yep. yeah. in terms of the students. And so um, that's a D interesting and important distinction to kind of make. Well, I guess there's some um, what I would call contextual realities that you have to deal with today. And we'll get down to a little bit more specific things in, in just a minute. But I guess I keep hearing all this about the student cliff. It's just a matter that the pool is going to get smaller and smaller. What kind of challenge is that? Is it true? And secondly, how do you go about mm -hmm. countering that? Go ahead. Yeah, I would just say, um, it's true to a, to a certain amount um, because birth rates tells you that going back for how many graduates are coming out in the next few years, we've reached that where the birth rate was lowering as we got to 2025 um, and then bouncing back in the next few years. So it does create less spaces, um, le less students that is college ready to go into all the different universities. Um, so it, it can cause some challenges when um, if you don't have the the big brand, you're not one of the power five conferences, I like to say, um, where you're out recruiting like we are for small, small campuses um, with uh, 
with some really good academics, but um, just the availability of more students. So you got to diversify how you your recruitment strategies. And for us, we choose to, um, and we want to be accessible. You know, so when I say accessible, I'm thinking um, from rural students to students of color um, to different population, first gen students, uh, military students. So we're thinking along those natures. Um, but there's less populations for those who are typical graduating from high school, um, and we're seeing that cliff here. So Bob, I want to educate your viewers on the difference between um, college ready and college going and what that number that you're referencing with the cliff or college going. There are a lot of college ready students that aren't consuming higher education and that's where we need to look in the mirror okay. because we're only serving what we know to serve and what we've known to serve for the last 200 years in this country are a particular type of student that is the cliff. Mm -hmm. There are still other students and they are still college ready. They just haven't been traditionally college going. So we need to look at the brand. We also need to look at the product that we're putting out and whether that product is reaching those families. And so the cliff actually doesn't concern me because to me, if higher ed's doing a good job and we lower barriers and we become accessible and affordable, then we have a bigger pool of college going students and we have to allow for that consumption to grow if we put the product that they need in front of them. That's an important distinction to make. And another thing I see within your expertise, a more holistic look at students. And um, I, just anecdotally, um, it's all about the fit we talk about. Because I, for many years in the classroom, it was kind of interesting when a student visited UVA and visited Virginia Tech. And they always say, no, it was obvious when you're on the campus, when you visit, if it's a good fit, and I guess that's one of the things that results from a more holistic look at uh, admissions. Right? Um, so what are some of the indicators of student success? What are you looking at? A little bit more specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, first and foremost is um, the classes the student are taking in high school and how they're performing within those classes. So the quality of their academic um, preparation for um, college um, it's very important as we look at Rona College that we're looking at applications. Um, so that, that's, just, that's going to tell you more than what someone does on a Saturday morning for SAT or ACT. So we're, we're test optional, one of those schools where if a student w chooses not to submit a test score, then um, we will review them based on that high school transcript um, and how well they're prepared. In the same process, we, we're one of the schools that still look at essays. Um, so we want to make sure students is telling us a little bit something more about themselves um, that's going to make them a good fit for a Rona College type student. So I think over the years we've always looked for that fit because it's a, it's a, it, it's a different type of student that's going to be successful or want to be at a small school. Um, so we're looking at that and same things within the application can tell us from what they're talking about in the essay, um, have they done any community service, um, how have they worked within that community and how they work with others because we want to make sure we're bringing that type of students into our environment where it's very community focused, a um, lot of hands-on learning. So those are the things that we look up in the application process. Mm -hmm. We were talking before the show about fit and uh, JP and I have been in this business for a while <laughs> and when we go into a crowd of students, we can see within a few seconds of a conversation the fit. Yeah. We can say, oh, you are perfect for a small women's college or man, you are perfect for William and Mary. You know, so mm -hmm. we, we know the state and public institutions of Virginia so well that we know the personas that fit well in those. So I think fit is a little bit of a persona yeah. as well as an academic profile. But you can see the students that are able to thrive, even if the GPA doesn't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. I think you can see what they've been through. You know, there's uh, the non-cognitive variables that folks are looking at now, which are grit and a ability to overcome adversity, those types of things that, again, in admissions that we look for in applications, we can tell from a student's school. Um, a student at Grundy High School has a very different experience than a stu student at Norfolk Academy, right? Very different experience. So being able to understand the context of which, from which the student's applying is really important. Well, um, there are some considerations that may not be a appropriate it depends upon the institutions but I'm curious about your thoughts and so I just want to throw a few out there and, and get a sense of somewhat importance what have you um, affirmative action ruling that is probably differs a great deal but you still want to have a good mixture of students how do you go about ensuring that you will have um, a broad mix of, of students 
I think it's a great question, Bob. Um, which, what I think schools um, should do and have been doing is how we go out and recruit. Um, so we want to make sure that if our priority is to increase our rural student, then we need to spend some time in the rural high schools. Mm -hmm. um, if our priority says we want to add more military students, we need to find where are those military students located and we start the recruitment process. Mm -hmm. um, because you're only going to get a mixture if they choose you. As much as I think we all spend a lot of our resources out there, but in the end the students has the choice. Um, so we want to make sure they understand that it's going to be a um, great learning experience at uh, Rona College or Rafa University for those students. And that to me is what us professionals in the business have to continue to focus on because the affirmative action has its um, reasoning why it was overturned. Um, we know why. I always go back in this conversation and just say to folks that why was, it ex why was affirmative action put in place before to give people access, to take care of those um, students who wasn't able to go off to college before. So now if we're removing that, we as professionals still have to find a way to help those students have access to a good education. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add to that, I mentioned earlier about getting to the populations that maybe weren't cultivated to consider yeah. higher education in the past that haven't been at the table. Um, we have to get to those hard to reach places. And I think that's again our challenge because we've kind of, as, a, um, an, as an industry, higher education has always been able to kind of allows people to come to us, we need to get to them. Mm -hmm. And finding students now post COVID and in the digital age where they're spending a lot more time at home and behind you know, walls, mm -hmm. um, it's harder for us to, to be creative in how we reach folks. But who we reach and how we reach them is our challenge, right? It's higher education's challenge to do. And I think with that, I mean, we live in a very diverse country. We should be representative of that country and the state that we live in. Right. Well, now you mentioned that you're optional in terms of the SAT and ATC. If one of them says, now, will it help me or hurt me? Should I take it? Hmm. Where do you stand on that? If I come to you and say, now, now, give me some advice. Should I take it? We hear that question all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so my standard answer with families, and I think it's, um, it's really, it goes back to their choice. Mm -hmm. um, if you feel comfortable with your score and you want to submit it, then go ahead and submit it. Um, I try not to lead families to say it's my choice. It goes back to if the parents say we've taken it three times and we need to submit it, that's between you and your child. Um, but if it's going to give you an advantage to submit it, then, then submit it. If the average test score is where you've scored and higher, then I would say go ahead. But if it's not, then it's not, you know, so it really goes back to the family choice. But you try to give them a, enough information so they feel comfortable with the choice they make. Yeah, so for test optional schools, that should be the philosophy, right? right? It's, a, it's an option and it, um, you submit if you want to and you can imagine those that submit typically are very proud of their scores. So right. it kind of has inflated the averages <laughs> yes. across the country. Yeah. That's just, um, you know, that, that's expected. But I will say this, and one of the things that I've learned is that um, we still have some scholarships that are privately mm -hmm. funded at institutions that require the ACT and SAT, and we oh. cannot deviate from those mm -hmm. until we get permission from the donor. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. some schools kind of scurry to do that exercise of calling up the donors and saying, can we please remove this barrier for students to be considered for your private scholarship? So that's really the only reason I would choose for one of my children to take it is so that they don't leave money on the table. And, and I'm, gonna get, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this or asking this. But um, given the impact of COVID, given how poor the most recent SOLs were across the state of Virginia, how do you test the transcripts? How do you te mm -hmm. uh, uh, believe the, uh, the high schools, mm -hmm. the quality of them? At least the SAT perhaps would, if it's standardized, you would get some notion, mm -hmm. wouldn't you? I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think of that? Yeah. I would say <laughs> all, all things are not created equal, uh, you mm -hmm. know, so we do as professionals um, from the high school side to the college side have to trust that, um, trust their educational process. So we're able to look at that profile and see, for me, one of the things you can look at is how many students they're sending off to a four-year college. That tells me how strong an academic curriculum is. So we just have to trust that. You're right, I, I think there's, um, to an extent, um, with COVID and the online learning, have seen some SOL scores different from previous before COVID. Um, but I think we have enough relationship with the high school counselors that we have to trust that, you know, and work with them in the process. So I have three kids. One was in elementary, one in middle, one in high school during COVID. 
I can't imagine learning the way they had to learn for those years. And for them to be behind the curve and standardized testing, in my opinion, the curve needs to move, right? And it needs to change. So I think that's one implication. Um, I don't know how much the SOL has changed the uh, methodology behind the scoring, but my thought is there needs to be a curve, um, you know, look, hard look at that. Um, and also I think folks like um, the autonomy of learning and understanding the impact of what they learn and SOLs just don't yeah. gauge that, right? So for us to put so much um, emphasis on a standardized test does not really show that the student is interested in what the impact they're learning and where it's going. I'll also say that um, there is a national concern with math readiness um, for all schools. And so I'm not sure about Renault College, but at Radford we implemented a math readiness because we needed to make sure students were able to do the math that they needed to go on for some of our allied health degrees and other degrees. And so again, even there we're seeing a, a big shift, but I think that's just par for the course because of the way um, education was delivered for those years and just the effectiveness of that. So uh, when you're setting your goals and targets, um, uh, are there structural considerations? So for example, geographic considerations, North Carolina, more in-state, Virginia, do you want someone from every county in Virginia? And so what is the role of starting with geography? How do you mm -hmm. look at that? So for a state institution, geography is really important because we are designed to serve the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so the majority of our efforts are within the confines of the state. Um, out of state and international recruitment and enrollment is fantastic. And there should always be a strategy to serve populations that are outside, but the real, um, um, you know, services to the Commonwealth of Virginia, at least at the state level. So you were asking about whether counties are involved. I do think we have a responsibility to be in every county mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth so that folks know in those counties they have a space at my state institution, at Radford in particular. And so I think it is part of our responsibility to show that we do have an interest in students from all counties. Yeah, I hinted to it a little bit earlier. Um, Ronald College, we have probably about 48% out of state. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going um, pretty much the East Coast, but want to make sure we can serve some of the programs that we have. So we may look to strategize out of state in that way. Um, knowing that for the state of Virginia, we do want to make sure we give um, some consideration to in-state students and make sure that we're able to attract them from every part of Virginia. But we'd spend a lot of times really thinking about um, based on budget, based on priorities, if we're able to hit some different areas of the country. So. Um, what about male to female? We know 57% of college students are female. You have concerns about as you recruit for, in terms of the need for more males, or do you see it that way? Uh, for us, um, I want as many students as ready for <laughs> Ronald College as possible. Um, so being a small school, I, I look at it from that sense, and we do have a heavy population of female. I think it is right at 56% of our population is female. We're adding football this year, so that's gonna be something that'll be able to help us attract more um, males to campus. We also add in um, cheer, so you, you, we don't keep that for NCAA with from when it comes to sports to make sure we have a good balance there. But for the most part, um, when it comes to admissions, I just want um, students who could come, be successful, graduate, and be good, great alumni and give back. So. Yeah, we've never had goals that were tied to gender ex um, recently, but we were founded as a women's college. So originally that was our design. And so yeah. education, healthcare, those are fields that attract mostly women. Yeah. However, we have 70 programs and we've diversified obviously through the STEM areas and other areas that um, traditionally have, have enrolled men. So we too will take as many qualified students that we think would thrive at Radford. We want them there. Um, and so I definitely don't think gender is one of the areas that we would um, consider um, having weight in the admissions process at, the time, at this time. So uh, when you start building and, and projecting and, and different things like that, do you go and look at certain majors, targeting um, certain colleges or what have you? I mean, in other words, you want your programs to be successful. I'm assuming that that's kind of an internal thing, like how many majors could X department mm. take? Is that stuff part of the calculus? At Ronald College, it really hadn't hit to that level. I worked at schools previously where we did look at it by major, um, but there we're really we're getting ready to um, restructure our whole academic programming. So everything is just by departments now, but we're about to go into schools of business, schools of um, um, 
performing arts and those different things. So I think we'll have four different schools that's going to be coming in probably another year or so. Um, we'll be able to look at those numbers and see if it's going to be strategically advantageous for us um, to recruit in those areas. But right now, um, once again, we're, you know, we're trying to um, continue to look for those best fit, best prepared students that's going to be successful at Roanoke. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we don't admit by major either, and we all know that students change majors several times, <laughs> yes. and some double major <laughs> and minor, and so it's hard to be predictive of a 17-year-old or an 18-year-old's decision making, right? And so um, I too worked at a school that admitted by major and is a very different strategy. That's not the strategy we have. We want students to be successful, mm -hmm. and they, we want them to journey and navigate while they're in the right. academic enterprise. Um, I will say this, though, we are opening a new uh, building that's going to have a lot of performing arts, uh, interior design, uh, photography, uh, and so there's m some majors that I'm looking at particularly now just so that they can enjoy this new building that's uh, been named and will be open next fall. So as you mentioned, like if you have majors that are growing or a new building opening, you definitely want to fill those seats. And so, you know, like I said, we just serve the institution in the moment and the strategic um, initiatives they have at that time. I think some of the myths is that how you can play the game is, well, I'll get into, quote, English, and then I can switch to engineering. Like, well, I don't know. But anyway, right. they think it's easier to get in one major than another, and that's interesting. I would like for at least one of you to explain to the audience where so they understand when you're going out, you have a number, you have applications, but then there's the yield mm -hmm. and target that and as a process. Um, it kind of explain the differences um, in, in that discussion so audience can understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I would say um, the difference is that um, the goals by, by your um, institution, you're going to look at historic numbers over the last five to six years based on um, where, how many applications you can get. Um, we tend to work backwards, <laughs> I would say. So that yield number, as we've seen over the last few years, have really um, gone down in a lot of institutions. And that just mean because students are applying to more, multiple schools, um, so they have more opportunities. So you, you can't totally predict the yield as you could in years past. You know, so I'm um, seeing a lot of schools in our um, private institutions, CICV, CIC um, grouping, that are seeing yield rates closer towards the 10% mark. So you have to work in that sense how many people you can be admitted um, and how many applications we can get so we can um, help impact um, the admit rate and the yield rate. Um, but that's, that's how I see it a lot of times. It's really um, each year you have to be going down the stretch thinking and going down the end of your, process, your, your recruitment year to make sure you understand is your yield going to help you get the class that you're looking for based on that goal that's set. And would you recommend um, doing an admissions interview? If you have so we, I know for our institution, we don't require interviews and it's not something that we use in the admissions criteria, so it's not part of our process. I wanted to um, focus for just a second on the yield question. Um, the, the rules of engagement have changed. Yeah. I will say that it was once upon a time kind of a um, etiquette to only deposit at one school. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. Students are depositing at various schools. And so when you mm -hmm. think they're coming to your institution and you treat them like they are, they actually are still shopping around until the first day of classes mm -hmm. in the fall. So it used to be that predictive model was pretty um, solid indicator May 1st. That's no longer the case. And so the melts that we're seeing are, are big. We're also seeing that other institutions are starting to pull from wait lists so that they can backfill some of their empty spots, which is a new practice that I think has always been around, but probably is being used more strategically now. So if you were anywhere on the second or third choice for um, a student and they get their first choice, that yield is very much um, predicted by other institution behaviors. So again, there's a lot of variables and then affordability is always, I would yes. say, one of the top variables. If somebody gets more scholarship or aid, they can make decisions based on that. So that is hard to predict. But. So we're down to a couple of minutes. So I want to provide each of you an opportunity to share some final thoughts as you look to the future in terms of that. What would you share? Yeah, I, I would just say um, education is still one of, um, is very valuable. I would say to families as they look into this process and just think about college, that it's very valuable. It does afford a lot of opportunities for families. I know being a first generation college student, going away getting a four year degree and getting a uh, master's degree uh, has changed the trajectory that I may not have otherwise had. So I would just encourage families to continue to see it in that sense. Um, um, and there's gonna be a school that's gonna be a good fit for you. 
um, and affordability, there are scholarship opportunities out there. So um, to me, that's very important for the audience to know and to families to continue to realize that, that you have, once I say, because um, me and Danette have been knowing each other for a while, that you have good colleagues at every school who's going to be there to kind of help the students out, help the family understand this process. And to me, that's very important to know that we're there to help you. And in final moment, minute or so? Yeah, so, I, uh, so we know that more education usually leads to happier people, healthier people, higher tax paying people. And so yeah. education mm -hmm. is good for everybody. And so I hope that folks um, reacquaint themselves with the value of higher education. Once upon a time, work was about muscle, and then we feel like it's about brain now. And I'm, the prediction is that in the future, it's going to be about heart. And those folks that are going to be able to lead in this next millennium is going to be folks that are able to do the work of a courageous leader. And so I think our institutions build those folks from scratch <laughs> yes. and pull them out of the ashes at times so that they become those courageous leaders. So I'm really hopeful for a place like Radford and Roanoke um, that we, we do that very well. well. Believe it or not, that's all the time we have. I certainly want to thank my guests for joining us. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us and hope you do so again for the next Conversation with Bob Denton.